Okay, um, good morning, everybody. It seemed like I just saw y'all Friday, huh? <laughs> uh, Karen, um, have we met the Freedom of Information Act? Yes, sir, we have. Okay, good. All right, um, I call the public safety meeting order. Could you take roll call, please? Yes, sir. <laughs> Mr. Lance? Here. Mr. Harkin? Here. Mr. Grant? Here. Okay. All um, minutes from the January 27, 2020, also. Second. Um, the approval of minutes. Do I have a motion? So moved. I second the approval. Okay. okay. Um, all, could you call roll for approval, Karen? Yes, sir. Mr. Lennox. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mr. Harkin. Yes. Mr. Grant. Yes. Okay. Unfinished business at this time. Dirt road update. Um, do we have somebody for the town to present something? Oh, Mr. Coltrane, good morning. Um, you're muted. I, I am muted. Now I'm not. Good morning, and how are you, gentlemen? Um, good morning. I, I don't think uh, we, we have two things that I was going to bring you, give you a short update on. One being the status of, of the end of Mitchellville Road that runs from the state road over to the town's property on Port Royal Sound, sometimes also referred to as Mitchellville Lane, and then Pinefield Road. As uh, the committee may remember, um, there was a question about what area existed between the lots that front along Mitchellville Lane. All of them had recorded surveys but it was hard to tell from the recorded surveys what the what the gap was or the hole that was left by the survey. Anyway, we've had that uh, examined by a surveyor, and that surveyor, uh, which is um, Sea Island Land Survey, has delivered a survey based on that. And I don't have the ability to um, show you, but in any event, it it does show an area that is sufficient to create a 66-foot road right of way between the areas defined by the existing surveys. In fact, it may be a little larger than that. All that said, um, I understand from, from engineering, the staff that's been working on this, that we, um, there are, there is general, and by general I mean minus one, agreement of the adjoining landowners to quit claim whatever interest they might have in this road area to the town, there is one individual who is unwilling to do so. And so in order to um, deal with that person's interest, you would have to condemn it out. There is also um, going to be a need for a condemnation under any set of circumstances here because the, the, the title of this particular road area is is uncertain. Um, as, as I explained to council, I think as a whole previously, um, this whole area comes out of a, a much larger tract that was 75 acres or so at the beginning of the 20th century. And, um, and, and over the years, uh, bits and pieces of it were conveyed out, none of which really addressed this area where Mitchellville Lane sits now. So you do have um, the, the parlance in title clearance cases is, you know, unknowns, um, people who may or may claim some interest in this road area. And so a case would have to be commenced in order to uh, deal with the potential for claims by unknowns. Typically the way that's handled, of course, is since you don't know who they are, you publish the summons in the newspaper and 
And, you know, of course, no one answers that because <laughs> no one ever does. And, uh, well, that's not true. Sometimes someone shows up. But anyway, there would be, you'd have to run through that. And then you're also probably going to have to deal with the um, one individual who um, apparently is is unwilling to to quit claim whatever interest he might have in this area. Based on what is before us right now, um, I don't think that person has any actual interest in it because that person <coughs> took title off of a plat that uh, defines the boundary of his property. And so, um, uh, you know, that's there. So that that's what would have to happen in order to completely um, clean up the title to the Mitchellville Lane area. Um, as has been reported by staff, as I understand it, you know, again, all but one are willing to to, to, to execute a deed in favor of the town for whatever interest they may have in this particular area. And then we would have to, on the back end, clean up the interest of any unknown parties and the one person who doesn't want to do that. If that is council's decision to move forward, that will require a condemnation um, of, of those interests. The situation on Pinefield Road, moving on to that one, is is much the same. Um, you have uh, differing views by the ownership along Pinefield Road. Um, there was an email from Jeff this morning. Uh, let me see. Do I did it give us the exact exact number of, of of folks? But you have a mixture of of interests along Pinefield Road. Some are willing to. Um, quit claim their interest in a roadway area to the town. Some are not. It's it's more than one, one you know individual along there, and so the question for council would be at that point, you know, do you do, do you want to go ahead and do that? That's somewhat at odds with the stated policy with respect to to this sort of issue. But I mean, that's that's kind of where you are there. Uh, uh, Curtis. Yes. Uh, on the uh, in the first situation where one individual is uh, holding out, uh, do you know what their reason is for not? I I I do not. I mean, what has been said, what I've heard is, is that the individual is just opposed to to the improvement of the road and and what that might bring with it. I mean, you know, that's 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 secondhand at best, and maybe further than that. <laughs> so so I don't know really. Uh, on on both of these roads, are we dealing with a, ma uh, a majority that's predisposed to working with us? Certainly along Mitchellville Lane, there is a majority based on the information that I have. The, um, and I wish Jeff was here because he had the data on, let me see. Let me see something, hold on, let's see. I see Jeff, Jeff is here. Okay, then Jeff, on Pinefield Road, Pinefield, are the, what is the percentage of, of those willing to cooperate and quit claim an interest as opposed to those who are not? That was Mr. Harkin's question. You're muted. You're, you're muted. Still muted. <laughs> oh, oh. Hey, Corey, I'm on a Zoom call with Tom. Can I call you right back after? Okay, thank you. Oh, there we go. All right. Yes, uh, eight of the 14 property owners on Pinefield submitted a petition saying they are willing to participate with the program. So, so the majority, more than half. And how about Mitchellville, Wayne? Um, only one. It was um, eight of nine there. And and as I recall. We were willing to proceed 
with uh, developing these roads uh, if we could resolve uh, any legal issues with the people that were bordering these roads? Yes, from last November's meeting, that was the direction. My, my thought would be if we clearly, if we're dealing with a clear majority and we were interested in proceeding before, then uh, why don't we proceed? Um, my suggestion would be we consider proceeding forward and recommend same to, to town council. Those are my thoughts. Yeah, Jeff, I got one question. In reference to, um, I don't feel good, I feel very comfortable about Mitchell, but my question is about Pinefield. <clears throat> First, um, what, do they have any specific concerns why they don't want to have it paved? Because um, it's been a while since we talked about Pinefield, so I was just trying to get caught up on that. Um, there were no specific no, sir, concerns, they just heard. I have not heard any specific concerns as I have on Mitchellville that they don't want uh, the road paved, they don't want the government involved, et cetera. I think it may just be out of state uh, owners with rental properties who, who may just not be um, committed to responding. Uh, it was some time ago when we sent those petitions out, we could make a, another run at that, uh, resend them. Um, okay. You're you coming in and out, I can't hear you. I said, no, I don't know of specific uh, in disinterest in the program. Um, like I say, they were just generally non-responsive, the ones we did not receive. Okay. All right. Yeah, I would. I feel comfortable about Mitchellville. My only question is about Pinefield. Did they have problems with, did we take too much property in their front yard um, or any major concerns like that? That was my only issue about Pinefield that I got to get caught up on. But I feel very comfortable in terms of Mitchellville moving forward with that one. Okay. Um, Tom, do you have any questions? Uh, no, I, I agree, Mark. If, uh, if there's a clear majority in, in Mitchellville and Lane, there, there clearly is. Uh, I think we should move forward. Uh, I, I, I would be interested. I was unaware that there were rental un units uh, on Pineville. Uh, Jeff, if you have the wherewithal, it would be very, I think, meaningful to understand how many permanent residents out of the 13 we have versus rentals. Okay. I will research that. I agree. Okay. Um, is our attorney still on? I just have a question for him, if it's possible. I don't see him. Well, I'm, I'm here, but I, my oh. video is off. I don't know if I can... Can I turn that back? No, you're fine. Oh, there I am. All right. <laughs> Curtis. I just said one question. Mark, you're breaking up. I, I can't hear you. Do we have Mark, we'll break it. Wait, Mark, I can't hear you. Now what? Oh, I'll slow down. Um, can you hear me? Yes, now I can hear you. Okay. My question was, do we have like a standard procedure in terms of condemnation that the town council could approve? So when we see a road that is necessary to move forward on, that we've already proved how we move forward on it, and have to do is just do what you need to do to get the road um, approved by the town council to move forward on. So that's my question. Well, the 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 process to condemn is is set out in the in the Eminent Domain Act. So that's a that's a statutory thing, and councils. Council has to approve the condemnation via, a, you have to do a couple of things. You have to have whatever the interests are appraised. You have to make an offer to the landowners. And then in the event you can't resolve it without a condemnation case, then council approves filing of the case by a resolution. And then the case is filed and you, and you move on 
under the terms of the Condemnation Act. So the, the, the process that, that, you know, council has adopted a, a policy position, which, you know, tells us how, how council wants to proceed with these things. I'm not sure that there's much else council can do to standardize it. I mean, the, the process of the, of the condemnation is set out by statute. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the council members? Um, my last question is, do you need a motion from us to move forward at least on Mitchellville or are you ready to do what you need to do or needs to in reference to Mitchellville Road? I think there needs to be a motion to council to take action on that. Okay. Well, I, mean, I make a motion. Not a problem. I make a motion that we move forward on Mitchellville Road, and Jeff Buckler will do more research on Pinefield, so we all feel comfortable with that. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Second. All, all in favor? Uh, roll call, real quick. Mr. Harkins. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Mr. Lennox? Yes. Okay. And Mr. Grant is in favor. 3-0. All right. Thank you. All right. Let's see. Next is um, is new business, and we're discussing of um, the arts. Okay. Good. Jill McEwen is supposed to be on, correct? The Public Art Master Plan. Oh, how are you doing, Ms. McEwen? It's good, good to morning. see you. Good morning. I'm great. How are you, Mr. Grant? Good. All right. um, so what we have is our Public Art Master Plan. Um, this came about originally with the Community Foundation of the Low Country coming up with the um, a new additions to the approved sites where we would potentially have art on page 14 you will find. Um, historically, Town Council has approved these sites. Um, expanding this list allows us to um, plan for site-specific art as opposed to kind of historically what has been this plop art mentality of having a piece of art and then trying to retroactively find a location for it. Um, and so we pulled it together thinking that really a better practice was not just to piecemeal give you guys sites, but to give you an overall picture of a plan for public art on the island um, and put all of our policies and procedures in one space. Um, additionally, one change that has occurred this year is on um, last fall, the Community Foundation hired a consultant to come in and do an analysis of the island and our public art collection and kind of the interest and appetite for public art here. And what was, um, what sparked this was really just kind of some continued difficulties in raising money for the public art exhibit that was going on at Coastal Discovery Museum every two to three years. And after interviewing Steve and some council members and other community members, the recommendation from the consultant was to transition the public art program from the Community Foundation to the Office of Cultural Affairs, where we can use that same bu little bucket of money that has been going to the Community Foundation annually, and instead of having a temporary exhibit every two to three years, it allow us to have the temporary exhibit that will go in at the Shelter Cove connectivity path that was approved at Town Council a couple weeks ago. So we will have more art more frequently for the same amount of money. Um, so those are the big pieces to kind of point out here, but we, like I said, I wanted to just give you guys a thorough picture. And I think what we're asking is for your approval of the sites most specifically, but the overall plan and sending that to council for approval. I have one question. Um, yeah. I read over your document. I thought you did a good job. And I Thank recognize you. some of the threats and challenges as we begin to move forward. Do you see, especially with the COVID-19, what are some of the things you think you might be looking at trying to do as we move forward with this from now on? 
until this COVID-19? Or do you see us taking a break until the situation is over? And then also in terms of funding is a concern. Because do so, you need matching funds from the too? Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, 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 no. I didn't mean to interrupt you. So a couple things. Um, one, there are some grants that Marcy Benson and I have been looking at that allows us, particularly for that sculpture trail component, to um, expand the financial um, bandwidth of the town. Again, not it. there will be no art increase funding-wise, at least through this next year at the town. We can do everything we've been doing and more for what we have. Um, I will say, you know, bike, bicycling has been a socially distant activity um, for my family and I think for a lot of people on this island. So having that space where we will have that pathway of art of the large scale sculpture um, should be a great asset here. Additionally, on the other components, you know, I think I highlighted some mural painting and the lantern parade. The mural painting, we have moved forward with two projects. We just took out the community engagement component to it. So when students can go back to Hilton Head Middle School, there is a beautiful new mural that is complete um, honoring contemporary community change makers in our community. So Dr. Campbell, um, Louise Cohen, Dr. Esquivel, um, and the founder of Deepwell, the um, Miss Newhall of the Audubon Society are all now being um, honored at the middle school. And Amiri Ferris is currently working on a mural for creative arts based on Luna Moth Metamorphosis. Um, which was a STEM project we had been working on with the schools for the spring, and then when everything got shut down, um, that, you know, again, community engagement yeah. component came out, but we are still going to provide the art um, for the students and the community. Uh, Lantern Parade this year, we want to kind of keep that momentum and that community um, spirit going. So we have shifted to what I am calling a parading in place model. Obviously, we cannot gather 4,000 people on the beach, and we are still going to support the education mm -hmm. components. We're going to do some Zoom tutorials with artists. Um, I just had a really great meeting last week with the middle school. We're going to do a whole grade level project for the eighth graders. Yeah. Pardon me, eighth graders. So every eighth grader, not just visual arts, will get to create a sea creature and lantern. And then we're going to take three days. So originally, it was supposed to be November 7th. We're going to do the 5th, 6th, and 7th. And we are going to encourage people to put their lanterns in their driveway, light up the night, and then kind of mimicking the Santa and sirens model, we're going to put our large scale spectacle puppets in the back of trucks and parade them through um, areas with high participation. So people will be able to register on a map that our GIS department is creating online. Let us know they have lanterns out so people can see them, um, but also then we will take the big spectacle component of it kind of on the road. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Hart, did you have any? No, uh, <clears throat> in terms of the future locations, they all look fine to me. Uh, right. There's just one I'm not familiar with, the uh, former Rocks location. Where is that, please? The former, oh, the former Rec Center? The Art League of, um, is that the no, second it, to last one? It says former R-O-C-K apostrophe S. Um, I it, it, follow, it follows the uh, Sherwin Williams store, Cracker Barrel site. Or, I am looking at this page. Is oh, this all right. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm looking at in terms of my minutes package. Okay, so that looks like. The list, the page that is already approved. Um, oh. I don't know what the former Rocks location is. That was the oh. list that is from the um, Jamie Lopko might know um, because oh. this was the old approved list. The next page is the proposed site. If you scroll, okay. All right. I got Mr. it. Mr. Harkins, Mr. Harkins, this is Jamie Lopko. I'm on. Um, yes. The, the Rocks site is actually the Rocks Remy site that's there at Arrow Road in 278, where Sail Around is. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Thank you. So, uh, I think it's uh, well done and uh, thank you. Uh, I'm ready to move on. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you, Mark. Uh, Jen, uh, I want to acknowledge and, and thank you and uh, your public art committee for all the work that they put into this. I think your mission and your vision statements really capture the Hilton Head story very effectively. Uh, as it pertains to the forecast analysis and recommendations, uh, you're going to be busy if you <laughs> take on all of this. But there, there were four recommendations, Jen, that uh, kind of jumped off the page to me. Uh, the first is assuming management uh, for the town's uh, program. I think that's, that's the right step. Uh, the second is developing a temporary funding source for projects throughout the island. Uh, the third is to develop a first-year budget. I think that's that's going to be very important. I'm anxious to see that. Uh, uh, the fourth is to incorporate a strategy to grow the program, to enhance it. Uh, the program has been so effective that I think enhancing it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and the last is uh, a recommendation that I think makes a lot of sense also, and that is to involve uh, the VCB and our DMO uh, in the programming uh, and get it featured in the vacation planner and everything that the DMO does for us. Good work, Jen. Great, thank you. Uh, and just one last note so you guys are aware. Michael Marks, who is the chair of the Public Art Committee for the Community Foundation of the Low Country, um, has taken a seat on the Arts Council Committee, on my committee, to um, help assist in the human kind of human support system of transitioning and growing this program. Very good. All right. Do I have a motion from the council committee? Yep. Uh, so moved. All right. Second. Okay. All of it moving towards the town council for approval. Can we take roll call, Karen? Yes, sir. Mr. Lennox? Yes. Mr. Harkins? Uh, yes. Mr. Grant? Yes. Thank you, Jen. It's good to see you. Thank you, guys. Again. Okay, at this time, um, the Mitchellville um, plan, uh, master plan and business plan. Um, do we have a presentation? Somebody? Uh, good morning, Mr. Grant. This is Jamie Lopko. I wanted to give a couple opening comments and I'll turn it over to the Mitchellville folks to make a short presentation. Um, as you all are aware, we leased what used to be Fish Hall Creek Park to the Mitchellville organization in April of 2017. As part of that lease, there was a requirement that they bring forward a master plan and business plan within four years. So this is uh, meeting that requirement. Um, so staff would like to get a recommendation to move this forward to council, but there are a couple of things that we need direction on as well. And there's a couple of conflicts that we wanted to make sure get addressed. Um, one is that the lease currently requires that the um, land still remain a public park. Um, and it allows for them to close it for special events, but during regular hours outside of special events, it's still to remain a public park. The master plan currently calls for it to be a gated entry where they charge uh, admission fees to get in. So we will need to resolve that conflict. The second conflict is with the property boundaries. Fish Hall Creek Park, the only part of it that actually fronts on Beach City Road is a small narrow strip where the entrance is. And you'll note in the master plan, there is another piece of land um, included in the master plan that gives them more visibility on Beach City Road. That parcel is owned jointly by the town and the county, but it is currently not included within the master plan. So we would like to uh, make sure we get some direction on those two items today um, before we move this forward. And at that, this point, I'll turn it over to um, Ahmad Ward and Mady Fischetti um, to give you a short presentation. Thank you. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And there's Mady. All right, so uh, thank you for allowing us an opportunity to discuss uh, the plan with you. Uh, over the course of the, I guess, the last six months, we have sent you a business plan. Uh, you should have received a, not only a presentation from me and, and myself, who it's a little uh, longer than what we're going to do today, obviously, 
and uh, a copy of the master plan in totality. And I know that's a 204 page document, so it's completely understandable if you didn't go through the whole thing. Uh, but I wanted to address some of the stuff that, uh, that Jamie discussed and we'll do that during the course of the presentation. We have a short presentation for you this morning just to go over a few key things and Mady and I will kind of be tag teaming along the line here. And so, uh, Jamie, if you can get us started, we appreciate it. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So, uh, we wanted you to know that we have not been sitting on our hands uh, since we've been down during the pandemic. Uh, we, were un we were unable to do regular programming in the parks. We took everything virtual, including our Juneteenth Festival. Uh, last year, we had about 1,200 people in the park. This year, we partnered with five other museums around the country and uh, did an online virtual Juneteenth and reached about 35,000 people uh, online. So we think that was a good move for us to do. In addition, what we have on the screen is uh, last week, we were one of 27 sites to receive National Trust for Historic Preservation funding for the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund. Uh, we were the only site in South Carolina to receive this honor, and we were uh, one out of, let's see, out of the 27, there were 531 applications for this uh, financing. So we are very proud to receive this funding. Uh, this will help us go towards an archeological survey for the entire property so we know exactly where we can and cannot build. So. Uh, we are proud to have those things happen. Uh, next slide, please. So what we're going to do here, and we'll move as fast as we can, uh, Mady is going to go over some elements of the site plan, and then I'll talk a little bit about what we expect in phase one and phase two, and we will, we can address um, the issues we talked about before. But real quickly, I want to take you to, before I hand it off to Mady, uh, if you look in the upper left corner here where it says Beach City Road in yellow, we have two parcels there that we've included into the master plan, and those parcels are indeed part of the joint, jointly owned town and county uh, property line. And the reason that we have elements up there is because you will all remember uh, for a long while there was a conversation about the relocation of St. James Baptist Church. And so we had been working with the county and the town to come up with a way that we could potentially uh, live in the same area and make things work. And so during the course of all these negotiations, we were able to to kind of work with town and county to figure out a way we can have our elements and also uh, have a spot where the church can enjoy as much property and parking as possible. So that is the reason that we have those elements up uh, on the jointly owned town and county parcels. And we've been working with town manager and county officials, no, most notably the county administrator, to work out a situation where we can have an agreement for those two parcels since by the time the church, um, the this decision was made that the church needed to move to a different location, we had already had our plan completed and uh, had these things in the works. And so that's kind of where we are with it and we can have a, a larger conversation afterwards. So maybe if you want to quickly go through some of the elements in the, um, the site. Sure, yes, hi, good morning. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Good, just making sure. Okay, um, so just for uh, discussion's sake, um, this this plan's tilted a little bit, but I'm City Road North, so we can have north, east, west, and south. And I call the existing pavilion that goes out into the marsh, I'm going to call that south. So um, there's a few different nodes of activity and development that we're showing within the closest to the to Beach City Road. We've got our main visitor parking area. Um, and then we've also got what's called a classroom and lab building and a maintenance facility. Now the classroom and lab building, um, we'll talk about the phasing in more detail, but we could envision that as being kind of a first build building on the site that could accommodate some staff offices and then eventually be dedicated to housing collections and also provide lab space for the archeology span that's ongoing at the site. And that, that's letter J. Um, M is the main parking lot area, provides uh, parking for most people who are visiting the site. Um, so we've got two different entry roads, so it's a little bit of a loop. Um, we utilized existing road layout and disturbed areas 
because a lot of those areas have already had archaeology conducted on them. Um, and then also, just as far as land disturbance go, goes, we have a little less clearance. So where you see this loop road coming down and around toward A and back, so basically starting where it says Beach City Road, looping down toward A, which is a visitor center, and back up to S, that is close to the existing alignment of, of the loop road that's out there. So you see we're trying to minimize impact to the specimen trees and the um, existing natural resources that are out there as well as archeological resources. So leveraging some of what's already there. Um, of course, kind of the premier piece of, of this master plan would be a visitor center. That's letter A, kind of in the center of the site. Uh, that's an 18,000 square foot visitor center. Um, it would include gift shop, standing theater, um, and all of the interior exhibits. It also has a terrace off of the back, which overlooks what we're calling the event lawn, and that's B. Um, B has some, some footprinted, so something that's flush with the grade, footprinted areas that show the size of a Mitchellville structure, um, a house structure, and then also delineates those quarter acre sites. So um, as an interpretive element, it can, serve as, it can serve as an event lawn if there's a large event when we can all gather again. Um, but then as an interpretive element, when a docent or some site, they have a school group out there, they can say, this is your land. Somebody can visualize that. Now D is an exterior shelter, group shelter. Um, again, this would be, could be a phase one item, and it could be where we house some of our templates that may either move interior or become exterior exhibits <coughs> later, um, but it can serve as sort of a temporary museum space where we can, we can put some things in kind of an open air shelter and then later become a group shelter. Um, the visitor center would have accessible parking next to it, um, service area for trucks and, and getting trash in and out. Um, also, a large entry plaza that's an that that has the Mitchellville map interpreted in the pavement. Turn around and drop off area. Um, another very special part of the site is Freedom Plaza. That's E. That's a central feature park. Um, I went into pretty good detail on the on the longer about how that area works, but it, it's basically a plaza um, and also a eco revelatory feature that. Shows, shows some environmental um, pieces for the site. F is um, those little orange squares. Those are the interpretive house, that's the interpretive house area. We're thinking in phase one, those could be ghosted structures. And what I mean by ghosted is that it's a frame with a roof and some interpretive paneling built in. And then eventually some of those would become enclosed interior exhibit spaces, maybe in a phase two. Um, so that's showing a typical layout taken from the military map um, of, of the houses at Mitchell. And one could even have an interpretive garden area. I and H, um, again, this is taken from archaeology and also um, maps, so interpretation of, of the layout of the town. This is a, a special area. We've got a little rendering of it in a couple of slides. Um, where we think uh, the, one of the original churches at, at Mitchellville was, but it's also an area that is that's shown um, a continuous habitation, human habitation for thousands of years. This is where we've also found some of the most recent um, American Indian influence at the site. So there's this layer of occupation at this particular location that's, that's really special at this site. Um, and then the other element is an interpretive trail. And along that interpretive trail, um, we would have premier high quality exterior exhibits. We've got kind of a themes for different life ways exhibits, um, natural history exhibits, cultural exhibits. Um, and so we've, we've worked with one of the best planners in the United States um, to help us come up, come up with some of what those exhibits look like. He is a, a boardwalk that takes you out into the marsh. Um, it would include some interpretive elements as well. Um, U is a, an open air shelter. So we're looking kind of at the east side of the site. We're getting close to the sound. Um, still connecting everybody to the beach um, and having interpretation of, of what that bridge looked like that took people between the fort and the town. 
Q is what we think, and this might be the next archaeology project, but what we think was the one of the general stores in Mitchellville. And when we say that that is the general store location, we don't mean that it's a gift shop. We mean that it's the interpretation of general store. And just like the um, houses, this could be interpreted first with a ghosted structure and then eventually enclosed with interior exhibit. That's just, a, I know it's a lot of information. There's a lot going on in the site, but that's just kind of a brief overview of, of how we see the full build out. Yeah, next slide, please. So um, we we worked with a group of a, a group of national scholars and stakeholders to come up with the interpretive lens through which all of all of the exhibits at Mitchellville the, of of the park um, will follow. And basically, it's Mitchellville and the founded by the idea of freedom. And then the three themes within that are citizenship, self-determination, and opportunity. And then through all of our exhibits, we're going to be exploring um, six different uh, areas. So political participation, and we'll always be looking at the past and the present and the future in all of these. So it's, it's very relevant to today. Political participation, what did that mean in Mitchellville? What did it mean in 1980? What does it mean today? Education, religion, economic opportunity, and home and land ownership. What did those mean to the people of Mitchellville, and how do we expand that um, to to talk to the current uh, our current environment? Next slide, please. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, real quickly, we want to go through some of the elements of Phase One and Phase Two. Uh, so, of course, the non-interpretive amenities, of course, Wi-Fi is going to be necessary, parking, uh, bus turnaround, welcome area, and signage. And then we have the existing restrooms, and we'll look about how we can expand that. We really want to get to, and again, the larger uh, presentation goes into more detail with these things. So I please ask you to refer back to that. Uh, but a visitor pavilion with movable exhibits that would be, would be placed somewhere near where the actual interpretive center would eventually go. Ghosted structures, as Mady has already pointed out, uh, church cabin store, exterior interpretation signage along the pathways, an augmented reality tour, which we are actually kind of uh, uh, workshopping right now, wayfinding to help you get around the site, and of course, some elements of the boardwalk uh, that Mady referred to that connected uh, the town and uh, the army encampment. Uh, next slide, please. So just as an example, we have included the element that we have for the church site. Uh, we've, been, we've done about two years, two and a half years of excavation on site. And initially we were going to just, we were going to put a church, full church structure there and talk about the importance of religion and the importance of education, that this is where education first started before the school system was developed. Uh, what we found out during the course of those excavations is evidence of this probably 4,000 year old uh, Native American imprint. And so we've gone back to the drawing board here a little bit and we've decided to turn this into more of a reflection area that looks at the elements of church, but also includes these elements of the Native American experience here. And so what you see in the middle there with these two people looking at this, this long cylinder, that is a seven foot core sample. And we will be placing these core samples along the pathways in the park that just show you the different uh, spaces down underneath the ground where you can find the elements of history. So about three feet down, you've got Mitchellville. Okay, you put another three feet on that, we're talking about this 4,000 year old imprint. And so you want to highlight the things that are there and also look at the long standing connection between Africans in America and the American Indians here on site. We have a pretty good, um, well, I don't want to say a guess. We are pretty sure <laughs> that the people that were here are from the Catawba tribe. And so Catherine Sieber, who was our principal investigator on this uh, archaeological um, endeavor, has already reached out to the reservation in Rock Hill. And we're trying to work out a situation where they may be able to come down and, and not only give our, their blessings on this, but also help us to interpret this in the most uh, professional and most authentic fashion. Uh, next slide, please. 
So phase two, and there's when we can do more stuff. Uh, of course, same in the, some of the same non-interpretive amenities, but it would also include the event space in the interpretive center where we could seat about 250 people uh, to give another site where people can come and have events uh, and maybe make it a, more, a little bit more nominal for those organizations that can't afford to go to the Marriott or to Beach and Tennis. This also serves as another revenue stream for Historic Mitchell Freedom Park, so we can make sure that we are staying uh, as, as liquid here as possible. Catering kitchen, offices, restrooms, uh, general program storage, artifact storage, classrooms, gift shop, bookstore, uh, a lot of different things, in all, including a temporary exhibition space, which would be about 2,000 square feet. And so again, to, in the interest of time, we won't go through all of these elements. Uh, but next slide, please. We just want to go into a little bit of detail about what the interpreter center would be. And so there would be an intro film, maybe about three minutes, talking about the Battle of Port Royal, because this all starts with the Battle of Port Royal, an early part, early victory for the Union during the Civil War. Celebration and uncertainty. Uh, yes, we're excited that we've been liberated, but what do we do now? There's no primer, there's no template for folks who have been freed to do to go to the next step. And so you've got this uncertainty about where am I going to go? How am I going to live? How am I going to feed my family? Uh, Gullah heritage. This this place will eat, sleep, breathe Gullah culture without hitting you over the head with it. So every element we want to make sure is included in this because this is an important part of Mitchellville's history, the connection to Gullah heritage. And also, uh, quite honestly, we are in the center of the Gullah Geechee corridor. We're almost dead center. And so I think it's important for us to highlight the connection to that culture. From Mitchellville to today, uh, going from what happened in the first self-government site uh, South Carolina town of formerly enslaved people and how they had a voice and they were to vote on their own destiny and what that means for today and how we look at it today, which leads into what does it mean to be a citizen, not only of your own uh, neighborhoods, of your own towns, but a citizen of the world. And what, what is our responsibilities as citizens of the world? And in that, we can include living history, buildings, performance areas, again, that augmented reality tour, and lots of exterior interpretation. Um, so next slide, please. And this is an abstract. This is not a map. This is an abstract of what those elements would look like as you go through the interpretive center. And again, we're talking about 18,000 square feet. So there's two floors. We would go up, uh, including the observation deck on the top. Next slide, please. And this is just an example. These are not going to be actual drawings, but this is just an example of what we can do in the area. That first picture is from the latest uh, excavation that's happened in 2019, where we were able to really uh, solidify that the area where the praise house is was the site of an historic church. So we're about 85 percent sure that's where it is. And that's where the interpretation we just talked about in phase one will take place. And things like the middle pictures, what we can do where people can interact with the artifacts that have been found during these excavations. And um, if you look at the one on the right hand side, give you some more detail what what those artifacts meant to the people who were living at that site. Next slide, please. And so with this one is another image of the interpretive site plan, but you've got these dots that give you where the wayfinding would be, where those ghosted facades would be, the, core, the seven foot core samples that I talked about a little earlier. Uh, some bateau panels, we have some ex information panels that were shaped like bateaus, the uh, Borg wall panels, uh, virtual Mitchellville hotspots where we can really make sure that you can, you can use your your phone here to learn more about what Mitchellville can mean to you. Uh, I got to point out one thing about the uh, the boardwalk. Uh, in our investigations about the boardwalk, that that is more of a phase five situation now. <laughs> it's way in the future because after we find out how much those boardwalks really cost to go across the marsh. And so that will probably be a naming opportunity that will happen later on in our development. Uh, next slide, please. And so you have these numbers in a much larger form in the business plan and elements of the, 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 the master plan. So I just wanted to really break down what does all this look like? And I'll do it real quickly without killing you with numbers here. To do phase one, which we uh, dis you know, discussed with you earlier about ghost structures, some wayfinding, 
we're probably looking at around 5.7, 5.8 million dollars. Okay, to do everything cherry on top will run about 22.8 million dollars, and we know we already understand based on the the camp the campaign strategy that we're working on right now, and we are actively looking for a campaign manager to help us raise this fund. That this is a national funding project, and so we are already looking at targets uh, outside of the area to help us get to this point. We have a couple of really um, positive we think conversations happening with foundations, individual donors, and other organizations that can help us get to this point. And so, but because I've been in nonprofit for the last 20 years, we understand that this is a process. This will be a marathon and not a sprint. And we're looking at what we can do bouncing off of phase one and going into when we have 10 million, when we have 15 million, so we can eventually get to that 22.8. And so we think we have a practical strategy uh, to make sure that happen, and again, only thing that we're asking from the town right now uh, at this point is approval for the plan. And we are working on, the only, only thing we go after that would be the memorandum of understanding going forward, which we're already working on with Steve Riley to try to, to ensure, which would kind of take us to that conversation uh, about public access. And, and Jamie, you can you can take the slides down if you would like, and we can just have a conversation here. Um, and let me make sure I can see all of you. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm still getting used to blue jean. <laughs> so now I can see everybody. Thank you. Uh, so with the, the public access, we understand that a part of the lease that was um, created in April 2017 kept this as a public park. Our concern is uh, feasibility and sustainability for the park going forward. If it stays public area, that would drastically kind of shift what we do as far as admission, and how we can maintain the park. Now, the town owns the property, so we're going to we're going to do what the town has us for us to do. But that will mean that we will adjust how we perform the implementation of this plan. Um, we would prefer to be able to control access as much as possible to make sure that we are maintaining the things we're trying to put into the site to make sure it has this desired effect that we have poured into almost 18 months of planning here to make this, this plan work. And we think we have, um, with the market research we've done, we think we have uh, target audiences that can make sure this thing runs smoothly for years to come. The only hiccup that comes with that is if we have uncontrolled access, that also creates a situation with more maintenance on our site. And so if we were forced to, and I shouldn't say forced, if, if the town says, hey, look, you have to keep this public access open, then that would affect whether or not we create the full structures of those historic homes. Because we did want to do some, some interactive material there, but if we can't control what's coming in and out of the park, we, it, we would ill afford to want to put seven dollars $800,000 into interpretation on those ghosted structures when anyone can come in without us being able to regulate and you know do damage. And it's going to happen, any museum, any cultural attraction, you got to have some contingencies for people just coming in and pulling on stuff, okay? Stuff happens. But they're also in a situation where you can kind of see, you can kind of control a little bit more. And so what we what we have discussed with uh, Mr. Riley, and I would just say here, if we have to keep public access in the, in the park, then we would ask in the memorandum of understanding going forward that the town still assists with some uh, maintenance. Because if we got people come through our site to go to the park uh, with boogie boards and all the other stuff, it, that that burden of making sure that that area stays clean, but that kind of traffic should just be on our small institution. Um, and we're willing to work with the town to make sure that that we can work this out in the best way possible. Uh, we've had some conversations about whether or not there's an opportunity to collaborate with the county on access further down. Uh, beach City Road where there can be a direct line to the beach and we would make sure that there's access on our property to make sure people can get there. Uh, I know that has to be a more extensive conversation, uh, but we're willing to talk through this uh, to make sure that we can do what we need to do to keep us sustainable, but also to make sure that the public gets the, the best use of the site. So with that, I will pause and if you have questions, comments, 
uh, Mady and I are here to answer those. Well, I have one question in terms of the first the first thing you said, Ahmad. Right now, I believe that in terms of all town-owned pub property is considered public access. People have public access. And I do understand what you're saying in terms of when you um, begin to put up the ghost structures and the possibility of damage because of access. So my question would be to you, um, when do you see yourself starting to move forward on some of these things so that if we decide to move to uh, restricted access, that you would, that the town would feel comfortable, you would feel comfortable um, in terms of moving forward with the project? You know? uh, well, as soon as we have, a, well, we're not even waiting for approval. We are, we're actively trying to fundraise now. We okay. are actively trying to fundraise. But as soon as we have approval from the town, we'll be able to push forward with some of the funding that we have to try to do infrastructure on site. So it really is based on how funding comes in. And if some of these targets, um, you know, show positive to us early, we'll go moving on these ghost structures almost immediately if I have money in hand. Let me say this too. Uh, just as a, a reference point for this conversation about public access. If we must maintain public access, then we would probably uh, move admissions to the interpretive center, okay? That would change some of the wayfinding that happens on the site. Um, and some of the elements that we would put up, we may not put up, uh, just to make sure that we are not putting ourselves in a situation where uh, we will lose money. Uh, but at the same time, we would just control uh, access to the interpretive center, and that's where we would charge admission. You understand? And then we would keep those ghost structures ghosted, more than likely, uh, just to make sure that uh, however however the, uh, the population comes through, it, it's the least amount of damage for us, and they still have an opportunity to inter to have a, an enjoyment of the interpretation of the site. Okay, and I had a few in terms of, and this may not be for you, this probably would be for Steve, because I, my question is in terms of the Coastal Discovery Museum, that's public property also, right. but do right. they lock up nightly? I don't know. They, um, there is a gate, I think they do close the gate every evening, there's a gate at the entrance, yes. They, they do. Okay, and those are my two questions. Mr. Hart, could you have any questions at this time? Yes, uh, first, uh, Excellent report. Uh, one benefit of the, the COVID-19 is I had a chance to read the entire report. <laughs> and uh, it, it's uh, very well researched. Uh, I think uh, you're, you're well anchored uh, in the past and at the same time, uh, you're bringing it forward uh, to today's environment. So uh, that, that is, <clears throat> that's very good. and. Uh, I think it, it's going to represent a, a very dynamic and well-received educational opportunity uh, for for our, our area and, and the entire uh, country. And I, 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 I like your, I, I was fascinated by your core sample, you know, three feet, Mitchellville, the other three, the Cadaba tribe. And I, I think uh, going to that depth uh, is, uh, uh, very respectful, and uh, I think it brings another ally to the table. And I think that's that's uh, why it's clever and it's wise and, and it's appropriate. Thanks, sir. So uh, I I look forward to um, uh, doing what we can to to move this forward. Um, I think you you have made a good case from my perspective on uh, the controlled access. That to me makes sense. This is going to be a very special place and uh, apps of control uh, could create uh, un unnecessary um, mischief and I think we ought to try to avoid that and at the same time uh, reach out to the, the county and see if we can come up with some creative uh, alternative for access. Uh, so um, again I think we look forward to bringing this to town council and uh, you know it, and we've all been waiting for something like this. We, we've been waiting for this sort of amorphous vision to start being trans, translated into something 
that has a strategy, that has a business plan, and <clears throat> that we can start to see and touch. So um, I think as you uh, look at your um, potential funding sources, uh, you, you cast a net throughout the country. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think you're going to be successful. Thanks, Thank sir. you. Appreciate it. Mr. Lennox. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, I think I'd like to, to mention two things. One is the business plan, and the second is, is uh, the issue of access. Uh, Ahmad and I spent some time earlier uh, this year going over the business plan almost line by line, and, and Ahmad really has a, a, an enormous understanding of what a business plan is all about. Uh, and how to sell an idea and a concept. And I think this business plan does that. You you can start on page 39 and take a look at the chart a mob put in there uh, showing the sources of funding over time and going out to uh, a five-year pro forma. And what that clearly shows me is a shift in sources of funding and reliance on funding sources uh, that clearly shows a sustainability uh, that will be met by the Mitchellville if these plans hold up, and I suspect that they will. Uh, on page 41, he's got a detail of the expenses. Uh, we went through those, and I think as this plan unfolds, uh, they'll become more specific and, and more detailed, but I think uh, his estimated expenses are realistic. Page 42, he's got anticipated and expected staff. Uh, and again, we talked about uh, the levels of staff, when the staff will come in, and to the extent that any of these functions can be shared, uh, how appropriate would it be to share with Coastal Discovery and, and other organizations on the island? Uh, he's got uh, a very meaningful organizational chart on page 43. And then the meat of the plan starts on page 44, marketing and sales, and goes over to uh, page 47. And if we had to really focus uh, on anything in this comprehensive plan that Ahmad and his, his group have put together, I think I would focus on page 47 and 48. They talk about long-range planning, and they have three goals, and I think the goals are spot on, realization, validation, and sustainability. To the extent uh, that Ahmad can, can develop and execute the appropriate strategies and tactics under each one of those goals, I think this project, this effort, and this momentum uh, will be enormously successful and accrue not only to Hilton Head Island, but it'll accrue to the Low Country uh, and the Eastern United States as a whole. Uh, I, I am impressed where you are today, Ahmad, versus where you were two years ago. Keep it going. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Access. Uh, as to access. Uh, I don't think that that's something we have to deal with uh, right now. I, I think that's something that could, I hope it's something that can be dealt with uh, as we get further into the plan. Uh, if it's open access, I worry about uh, uh, the general public having access to gathering spaces and shelters uh, that may be important uh, from a programming standpoint. Uh, for, uh, for the, the Freedom Park itself uh, and for the Mitchellville and Native Islanders generally. Uh, so I, I would defer to Steve and to Curtis uh, as it pertains to not granting public access to what's deemed to be a public park. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Well, I, like I said, I heard, I heard um, Councilman Harkin, Councilman Lennox. Um, is Jamie still there? Is she still yes, present? Yes, sir, I am. So um, do, you have, do you have some form of understanding from us in terms of the language conflict, in terms of what would we like to be done in terms of the future of the lease? Or do you right, need I mean, something? 
neither one of them are imminent at this point because they're we're not developing anything and okay. the public park actually we, we we have plenty of time to discuss that and, and i hear your comments um but i didn't hear anything about the the property boundary conflicts i know we own those properties in jointly with the county but um is there any um comments or questions about including those within the the lease uh in the future well i can tell you in terms of my perspective and then i'll get the others to give um their input. yeah i do remember us talking about um the county owned portion of the frontage road when we were dealing with the st james issue but personally i don't have a problem if the county's willing to work with us so that Mitchellville could use the property and that could be part of the lease, you know, in terms of as we move forward. Um, let me get viewpoint from the other councilman. Mr. Harkins? Yeah, no, I, I agree uh, with uh, Mr. Grant and I, I think we should just be advised on the tactics here by uh, the town manager and by, by council. But uh, I, I would hope we could, we could take this off the table as, a, as a, uh, an issue. Okay. Mr. Lennox? I agree. Okay. All right. So does that give you some type of thought on Jamie? Of where yes, we stand? Sir. Yes, okay. sir. Thank you. All right. All right. Um, Ahmad, thank you for your time this morning. And Ms. May Fischetti. Okay. I do appreciate it. And I like to be a consensus of what uh, Mr. Councilman Harkins and Tom Lennox said. Very good job on the business plan. We look forward to working with you all in the future and getting this thing moving forward. Um, do you have any questions from us from this point? Uh, no, again, we just, uh, I'll speak on behalf of Mady here, uh, and I'll let her chime in if she'd like to. Just want to really thank uh, the committee and the town council for its support during this process um, and, and keeping things moving uh, and for being understanding when we had to the uh, length of time between funding from the county and us getting started. <laughs> it took a little longer than we wanted it to, uh, but we were able to get things together and we really look forward to getting this project moving. So again, thank you for your support and we're looking forward to working with you. Thank you, okay. thanks for your support. Oh, thank you. Thank Mr. Green. Oh, Jamie, I just have one question. Do we need to make a motion to approve the budget to the full town council in terms of the business plan or? Or Not the could. budget. We do need to make a motion to rec to forward it to town council with a recommendation. Okay. Okay. I just wanted okay. to make sure. Okay. Do I have a second? So, yeah. A so. second. Okay. Um. Karen, can you take roll call? I think we got. A, I made the motion. And yes, a sir. For Bill. Mr. Lennox. Yes. Mr. Harkins. Yes. Mr. Grant. Yes. yes. All right, thank you. Real vote. All thank right. you very much. Katie, Ahmad, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. We appreciate you. Thank you so much. All right. Um, I think the last thing is adjournment. Do I have a motion for adjournment at this time? So move. I'll second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, you all have a great day. And I'll mm -hmm. see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Good job, Mark. Thank you.